Okay, so thank you very much, Fabio. So, and thanks a lot for the invitation to be here to discuss neutrinos. As Fabio said, we're going to touch upon many different topics in neutrino physics. Some are going to be more theoretical, some more phenomenological, as well as astroparticle physics and neutrinos in the early universe. So maybe just for me to gauge a little bit, can I know who's doing more formal things, more pheno, more astroparticle? So who's doing kind of a, a PhD or postdoc in uh, phenomenology? Okay, the overwhelming majority. <laughs> okay, so you will not be kind of too upset when I mention experiments of things uh, of this kind. <laughs> okay, I see some faces here in front, not so happy. Okay, so um, Fabio said neutrinos are very important, etc. but why do you think neutrinos are important? I mean, for me, I have a list uh, here, I have a list of five, six uh, um, reasons which I find really crucial in particle physics uh, with some kind of priority list, but then uh, I would like to hear from you why do you think that one needs to know about neutrinos? <laughs> yes, they have mass. <laughs> That's a key thing. But why that is important? I mean, the electron has a mass, right? Okay, so indeed I think that is, uh, for me, the key question. So let's start with a title, Neutrino Physics. And uh, in my opinion, that's really the most important uh, uh, reason why we need to understand uh, neutrino properties. Uh, because neutrino masses imply physics beyond the standard model. And uh, we will cover that quite in detail in lecture number three. Really, we're going to see why neutrino masses cannot really be embedded in the standard model as it is. And we will look at extensions of it in terms of Dirac masses, Majorana masses, um, and so we are talking about the C, so, etc. So this is really, I think, central uh, to our understanding of particle physics. And then there are other questions as well, maybe some other reasons why you think neutrinos are somewhat relevant to understand. Okay, so some of you might be doing a PhD in neutrino physics. Uh, was there a way to yes, yes. So indeed, uh, we have lots of neutrinos from astrophysical sources and uh, in cosmology. Uh, so the last lecture will focus on neutrinos, especially in the early universe. Uh, so from astrophysical sources and in the early universe. Now, neutrinos are the most abundant fermion we have in the universe. I mean, there is uh, 100 neutrinos just in a bottle of uh, water. Now, which means that they really played a very important role in the evolution of the universe in several stages. And this is the way, for instance, we deduce the neutrino masses from current cosmological observations. But indeed, if you want to understand how the universe evolved, you need to know if this uh, relic neutrino background is there and what impact uh, it had uh, in its evolution. So that indeed is another very important question. Uh, another issue that for me is relevant is that neutrinos are the least known of all the fermions and uh, soon enough of all the standard model particles. Um, we know their interactions uh, quite well, but we still don't know their mass. We don't know their mixing so well. Um, we don't know if they have non-standard properties, sterile neutrinos, new interactions, etc. Which also means that they are kind of an ideal candidate if you are looking for physics beyond the standard model, because they could be the link to a new sector. Um, and so I consider this the neutrino portal. So neutrinos are the least known. of standard model fermions, and so they constitute the, what is called the neutrino portal. So an interaction, which typically is a Yukawa interaction with some other fermion, which could be a heavy um, a stellar neutrino, for instance, and this could be the way to look into new physics that could couple even quite strongly to neutrinos, but not uh, to the rest of uh, uh, the um, uh, standard model. We'll come to that a little bit later in the lecture. And there are another couple of other reasons which I find uh, quite interesting. Uh, neutrinos, in particular neutrino mass models, can also explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. 
in particular in cosmological models, um, where you have leptogenesis, and that is something that I'm going to discuss uh, quite in detail. This is a very successful way uh, to explain uh, the baryon asymmetry in the sense that within uh, the theory of uh, neutrino masses, you can also generate the right amount of baryon asymmetry that you observe. And last but not least, although I will now have a lot of time to discuss that, now neutrinos, or more specifically leptons, lepton mixing gives you another window into the flavor problem. Uh, the flavor problem, I think, is one of the most compelling we have in particle physics. We don't know why we have three generations and why the mass and the um, flavor states are not aligned. They are aligned uh, in quite specific ways, as we will see uh, at the beginning of the next lecture. The mixing angles in the lepton sector have uh, quite uh, uh, special values, if you want. One is close to zero, uh, and one is uh, maximal or very close to maximal. This might point towards some reason behind the flavor structure we observe. Uh, I will talk rather briefly about uh, flavor symmetries in the context of um, uh, leptonic mixing. But for me, it's important that because <coughs> lepton mixing and quark mixing are very different, these are two kind of complementary ways into this problem. I have to admit that from a theoretical perspective, I think we are still far from finding what is the underlying guiding principle uh, for the flavor problem. But that does not mean that it is a very important issue and something which we need to understand at some point. Okay, so I want to start. So these are the kind of the key reasons which I think uh, um, we need to look into neutrino physics in detail. And I will touch upon most of these in quite detail. And as I said, I will you know, discuss a little bit uh, more briefly the problem of uh, uh, lepton mixing because, uh, as I said, there's not kind of a standard theory of lepton mixing which has emerged uh, so far. Maybe at some point it will. So what I'm going to discuss in detail in uh, these lectures. So we are going to look at, uh, first of all, the basic of neutrinos. So, so their basic properties, the basic concepts, what they are. And these are things that uh, you probably know already from your uh, previous lectures, uh, the fact that how they embed themselves in the standard model, etc. And I will spend quite a bit of time talking about neutrino oscillations for two reasons. Uh, one is that this is the reason why we know the neutrinos have masses, and therefore is an important uh, issue uh, from that point of view. And the second is that there is a very, very uh, wide experimental program which is trying, which has already measured neutrino um, oscillation probabilities uh, in several different uh, um, situations. But then there is a program which, going forward, is even more exciting, and the next decade um, actually is going to really complete the picture that we have. So as this is a very, very active area of research. I want to give you the elements to understand what's going on and how to interpret the results which will come out. I mean, they are coming out now and will come out for the next uh, 10 years. Um, I will then go on to discuss the nature of neutrinos. And another process which um, is important from an experimental point of view, which is neutrino less double beta decay. So, well, as we know the neutrinos have mass, really the key question, in my opinion, is whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. I mean, this is different from all the other standard model fermions. All the others have charge. And this means that they cannot be Majorana particles because the charge distinguishes the particle from the antiparticle. Now, neutrinos are neutral, and therefore they could be Majorana particles, the only ones of the standard model. Now, it's not just uh, the nature which is important, but this relates directly to the symmetries. If uh, neutrinos, uh, sorry, if lepton number is conserved, then you can distinguish a neutrino from an antineutrino. You have a Dirac neutrino. If lepton number is not a symmetry of nature, then this distinction is not possible, and neutrinos are Majorana particles. Therefore, really, the nature of neutrinos is directly related to the fundamental symmetries of nature. And therefore, this, the symmetry is that whatever standard model, enhanced standard model um, is there, needs to respect. So this question for me is really very, very important because it's directly related to the conservation of, lot of, uh, of lepton number. I'll discuss that quite in detail. And the best way you have to test it is via neutrinoless double beta decay. And again, 
there is a very so there are several experiments running. I mean, uh, just uh, a month ago, a new experiment uh, presented their latest results. But even more interesting, there is new, much bigger efforts which are uh, being set up at present. And so again, the next five to ten years is going to be very, very interesting and exciting in this area uh, as well. Uh, then, as I said, lecture three and part of lecture four is going to look at neutrino masses from a theoretical perspective. How can we extend the standard model to take into account uh, neutrino masses? And of course, we have to look at extensions. We can do that in a variety of ways, which are gauge invariant. And this then can lead us to different types of physics and different types of consequences. Um, I'm going to discuss... Finally, neutrinos in cosmology, and if I have time, a little bit neutrinos in uh, supernovae as well. So here we'll discuss um, neutrino decoupling and then the various uh, times in the early universe when neutrino played a key role, big bang nucleosynthesis, last grid structure formation, the CMB possibly. Um, and I'm going to discuss as well the origin of the baryon asymmetry, probably in lecture four rather than uh, lecture five. So this is the plan of these lectures. Um, there's, as a, there are many variety um, of aspects, so we can discuss a little bit together. If some things are more interesting for you, I can develop more in that direction rather uh, than others. But as I mentioned, it's going to be a combination of more formal things and more fino um, aspects as well. I have some references, but th there is material on the website. Yes. Uh, so you can find that there. The only reference I want to give you is um, a set of notes that actually I'm going to follow quite closely. You can find, if you inspire, uh, you look for my name, these are the CERN um, lectures, uh, and these are notes which are quite comprehensive, and uh, you know, I put some care into not having typos and things like that, so they're going to be <laughs> useful. Okay, so what are we going to look at today? But just the first, uh, this first part, so this is today's lecture. And I want to start, uh, as it's just after lunch, with something a little bit light, a little bit of kind of history of neutrinos. You all know when the idea of the neutrino was put forward, which was... 31. Very close, very close, <laughs> by Pauli, right? So there was this, um, uh, okay, so you can look there, this problem, which was well known in the, uh, at the beginning of last century. They had observed beta decays, so the change from one nucleus to the other, and they could, oh no, they told me to switch this on. Mm. which I guess is beyond the theoretical physicists. <laughs> <laughs> Two theoretical physicists. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, and they could measure, uh, observe and, uh, the positron or the electron and measure their energies. And so they could reconstruct the spectrum in a beta decay. Now, they knew the energies of the nuclei. So, as you know, uh, in principle, the positron should carry away only the difference in energy between these two. So it should be a line in uh, this uh, uh, plot here. This is not the case. This is a kind of an experimentally measured spectrum in the 40s. So what is going on? Uh, and at the time, there were two main ways to understand this problem. One is to give up energy momentum conservation which from our kind of today's perspective is quite uh, a, a major, major, major departure from uh, the, the way we understand physics. And the other was to uh, include an additional particle which carried away the missing energy. At those, in those times, this was considered a major, major, major departure from uh, the way they were thinking about particle physics or nuclear physics in those times. So, it was Pauli in, uh, at the end of 1930 which proposed the idea of this additional particle um, to explain uh, this problem. He was supposed to go to this conference, but he couldn't. It's quite funny because he had to accompany the wife and the daughter to a ball, and so he couldn't go to the conference. So he sends this letter, uh, which is um, 
is just remarkable because it says written in German and says here, dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen, because there was Marie Curie, uh, obviously, um, in the audience. And it talks about a desperate remedy to save the energy theorem. I mean, this is, was really something which was difficult for them to um, really envisage. A new particle in addition to the ones uh, they were already known, which were essentially uh, the electron and the proton. Now, he sets down what are the key characteristics of uh, a neutrino. It needs to be electrically neutral, otherwise it would have been observed. It needs to have spin one half, and it needs to have a mass which is quite light. Otherwise, this generates a distortion in the spectrum, which is actually the way, right now, the Katrin experiment is uh, trying uh, to measure neutrino masses. So if you have this new particle, which he called the neutron, then the energy momentum balance is satisfied because this particle carries away the missing energy. So, and uh, uh, since uh, just uh, the year after, uh, Chadwick discovered uh, what we call now the neutron, as this was very, very light, then, uh, you know, uh, in Italy, in Italian, when we want to say that something is very small, we add ino at the end. So the neutron became the neutrino uh, in a, this conversation between Amaldi, later used by Fermi, and then the name is stuck to these days. Now, Fermi, very importantly, then set down the theory of beta decay in which neutrinos are involved, which in kind of in current uh, language is a four fermion interaction, and because of that it was possible to compute the cross-section, and it was thought that it would be impossible to detect neutrinos ever. Uh, this didn't take into account the rush to nuclear power uh, over the Second World War, so by the end of it, indeed there were powerful sources of new reactor anti-neutrinos available, uh, nuclear explosions, and they did think about trying to detect neutrinos in a nuclear explosion, and you can imagine, was not the best experimental setup. <laughs> <laughs> but there are also nuclear reactors. And so at the Savannah River experiment, indeed, in 56, uh, Reigns and Cohen were able to detect neutrinos. Uh, this is a remarkable experimental achievement uh, because they set the experimental technique to detect reactor antineutrinos, which is used to this day in our experiments. The problem is that neutrino interactions are very, very, very weak. So you need to have a source of neutrinos, which at the time were either the sun or reactors. Uh, and then you need to have a detector at some distance away, and you will determine that you have seen a neutrino if you see an interaction which is a specific to reactor antineutrinos, which is actually inverse beta decay. But you need to distinguish that from the tons of background that you have. And so in an inverse beta decay, as you know, you produce a neutron and a positron. And so if you can actually detect both of them in coincidence, this is something which cannot happen just by a random gamma passing your detector. And this is the way in which, indeed, we detect inverse beta decay, by looking at this coincidence between a neutron signal and uh, a positron. And it's quite nice, uh, this is. That's why I wanted to show you this slide. So this is the um, um, radiogram which was sent by um, Reigns and Cohen to Pauli, and they say, you cannot really see, but say, you are happy to inform you if you have definitely seen a neutrino. And what he replies, he says, thanks, this is Pauli saying, thanks for the message. Everything comes to him who knows how to wait. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, with neutrinos, one has to be quite patient. But, and since then, kind of um, has been an evolution uh, in the field. But first of all, uh, the key steps are, oh, sorry, this is going on anyway. Okay, sorry. Why? Yes. So, <clears throat> but first of all, a key um, step in the history of neutrinos is the discovery of parity violation, Madame Vu, 1956, and then uh, the experiment by um, uh, Goldhaber et al. Uh, determining the neutrinos are only left-handed. This is very important because um, this is the basis of then, uh, the standard model as we know it, and the bending on their interactions, the V minus A structure, and the uh, the, the standard model by um, Glashow, Weinberg, Salam, um, subsequently. Another key um, moment is the discovery that neutrinos come in different generations. So by till the 60s, they just knew that neutrinos were produced in interaction involving electrons or positrons. Then following a suggestion by Ponte Corvo, um, um, 
Lederman, Schwarz and Steinberger were able to produce a beam of neutrinos coming from pion decays, and these are associated to muons, because, as you know, because of helicity chirality cons um, uh, considerations, you know that the pion decays mainly into muon and muon neutrinos. So at the time, they didn't know if this neutrino was just a generic neutrino coupling to electrons and muons, or just to muons, and this was the experiment by uh, Lederman, Schwarz, and Steinberger in 62, which determined that if you let the neutrinos from pion decay interact, they will produce only muons, so they have a different uh, flavor. This is how we understand them uh, now. Um, and then, there is all the kind of the uh, big area of research in experimental physics uh, of astrophysical neutrinos. So they are produced in lots of sources. For instance, in the sun, you produce lots of um, neutrinos, electron neutrinos in, the, in this case, um, also in uh, beta interactions. You have um, atmospheric neutrinos coming from the decays of pions and kaons in the atmosphere. And these are all sources of neutrinos that um, were um, used um, to study their properties. Properties. Importantly, both, uh, well, and I just forgot to say that atmospheric neutrinos were observed for the first time in 65 by the Carl Goldfield and Reins experiments. Now, what has been remarkable uh, with these atmospheric neutrinos and solar neutrinos is that the observations didn't match the predictions, both in the solar sector and in the atmospheric neutrino sector. And this is what has led to the discovery of neutrino oscillations subsequently. Um, the idea of neutrino oscillations was put forward originally by Ponte Corvo in 57. And there are these two anomalies that I will mention a little bit later on. Uh, one in solar neutrinos. Um, started with the um, Davis experiment uh, at Homestake, uh, but then subsequently confirmed by the snow detector in 2002 and many other experiments uh, in between, which led to the Nobel Prize uh, to uh, McDonald in 2015, and atmospheric neutrinos. In particular, in 1998, the Super Kamiokande experiment was able to show that this um, disappearance of muon neutrinos observed was the um, uh, dependent on the angle with uh, which the neutrinos arrived on the Earth. And so um, the neutrinos coming from above travel only a few kilometers, and uh, there was no um, disappearance, so they didn't uh, um, do anything uh, special, while the neutrinos coming from below, which transfer the Earth, uh, were oscillating into something, or at least uh, transforming themselves into something else. In particular, we know now tau neutrinos, which are not observed uh, so efficiently in the super kamiokande detector. And in fact, if you want, the date which uh, starts uh, kind of contemporary neutrino physics is 1998. And this led to the uh, Nobel Prize to Kajita in 2015. So this is kind of a very, very brief history, but to tell that First of all, um, there's lots of uh, um, information on neutrino properties, but there has been a change, really a uh, um, game-changing um, discovery just 20 years ago. And since then, we have measured the properties of neutrino oscillations, the uh, parameters associated to it quite well, in a very, very rich experimental program, which I will mention in um, the next uh, lecture. So what are neutrino oscillations? Well, in, ba in the basics, uh, is a transformation of neutrinos from one flavor to another over some distance. And uh, let's go and look at that into uh, more detail. So now I abandon the slides. And instead, we go first and look at neutrinos in the standard model, just to set the basis of what they are and what their properties are. And then I will spend the rest of today's lecture to look at neutrino oscillations in detail. It's a phenomenon that we can understand just using uh, quantum mechanics. And so we can uh, derive, which we will do on the board, the probabilities which are relevant in different experimental situations uh, relatively, I mean, in a rather simple uh, way. So let's start by looking at neutrinos in the standard model. But you all know their properties. There. So you know that they come as uh, um, doublets. We have three generations of neutrinos.
we have new e, new mu, and new tau. And in the standard model, they are described by left-handed value spinners. Just as a comment, uh, you know that helicity and chirality do match uh, if the mass is zero. So in the standard model, these are perfectly uh, defined states and they provide no surprises. Now, from an age interaction point of view, they belong to SU2 doublets. So these are, so neutrinos belong to SU2 doublets. And this then tells me the interactions they have. They will have charge current and neutral current interactions. And also tells me that the, um, the way I understand each generation of neutrino, I define what is an electron neutrino by being the neutrino which interacts with electrons or positrons in a charge current interaction. That's what I mean with a new E, new mu, or new tau. This is because experimentally I can distinguish the electron from the muon from the tau because of their very different masses. As you know, they, are, they have no color, <coughs> they have no color and they have uh, no electric charge, electromagnetic charge. Of course, they have hypercharge. So I can write down then their um, interactions. So the Lagrangian in the standard model will contain a charge current interaction with the coupling G, of course. And I will sum over the three different uh, flavors of neutrinos of new alpha L, then I have a gamma mu L alpha, where this is the same flavor. So E mu or tau, actually, I'll write it explicitly, E mu or tau, with the W. And then I have also the neutral current uh, uh, interaction with the Z. And the last thing to say about neutrinos in the standard model is that we know that we have just three active neutrinos. And that is because we have measured the invisible width of the Z. There are three active neutrinos, and this comes from the invisible width of, uh, as I said, of the Z, which I can divide from by the theoretical prediction, and this gives me the number of active neutrinos, meaning the number of neutrinos which interact with the W and the Z, and this, the current value is 2.984 plus minus 0 0.008. So clearly, we have three active neutrinos. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot have additional neutrinos. Uh, and with neutrino here, I mean just uh, neutral fermions. Uh, of, uh, but they cannot have, they cannot partake in the standard model gauge interaction. So uh, later on in the lectures, I will talk about sterile neutrinos because there are some controversial hints uh, which are, yeah, I will, will discuss that. But ne these cannot have gauge interactions. However, they can mix with the active neutrinos. And if they mix, then they will feel these interactions indirectly, if you want. We'll discuss that a little bit more in detail later on. Now, this is for the active neutrinos. Now let's depart from the standard model and let's start discussing about neutrino mixing. So 
So now mixing in the for neutrinos is described by well a three by three unitary matrix, and you can um, you you know probably. So the active neutrino, the flavor neutrino, is a combination of massive neutrinos via a mixing matrix, which is a unitary 3 by 3 matrix. And here I goes into 1, 2, and 3. So usually when I use alpha, I mean flavor neutrinos. And instead with Roman um, subscripts, I mean the massive neutrino. Now, because of this, this will enter this Lagrangian and the charge current interactions. So I'll actually, well, rewrite it for completeness. So I can rewrite the standard model Lagrangian for the charge current part, which is the one which is interesting for us, in terms of the flavor states, but expressed in terms of the massive states. So here we'll have a U star alpha K, nu bar K L, gamma mu, L alpha L, W mu. And it is from here that then the massive states enter into neutrino propagation and therefore are responsible for neutrino oscillations. A comment, which is actually irrelevant, um, these two matrices coincide in the basis in which char the charge lepton mass matrix is diagonal. So I'm assuming that uh, what I call the flavor states in the charged leptons are also the massive states, which is the, the experimentally meaningful uh, definition, if you want. We will, we will see that when I talk about flavor models, this might not uh, be the end of the story. But this is what is relevant here. And this matrix is called the Ponte Corvo Maki Nakagawa Sakata matrix. And this is where a lot of the experimental effort has gone into the past 20 years or so in determining the entries of this matrix. A 3 by 3 unitary matrix has three angles and a variety of phases which actually end up with one or three uh, physical phases as we'll discuss um, in a minute. In fact, we will use this Let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Um, did the lectures last week uh, include a discussion of the CKM matrix? No, then we do the rephasing here. So let's look at this matrix a little bit more in detail. In many experimental situations, uh, you end up with a situation in which two, only two neutrino mixing is relevant. In that case, it's very, very simple. So if you have two neutrino mixing, the, mi the mixing matrix is simply determined by one angle. There's also a phase, but this phase is not relevant for neutrino oscillation, so we don't need to talk about it right now. If you have instead free neutrino mixing, generically, a 3 by 3 unitary matrix can be written as one central matrix which has three angles and one phase which is distributed a little bit all over the place in the different entries. 
And then there are additional five phases. One is a common phase. And then I, I have here two diagonally, diagonal phase matrices, which contains two phases here. Can you see up there, or should I write a little bit bigger? So, yes, I'm going kind of <laughs> smaller. Um, and uh, another two phases here. Row E1, row E1, 0, 0, 0. But it's just a diagonal matrix. Okay. So we need to determine how many physical parameters we have. So what we need to do is to see if we can eliminate some of these parameters from the Lagrange. And if we do, those will not be physical uh, phases. So remember that this matrix is sandwiched here between the neutrino on one side and the charged leptons on the other. So let's keep this. Um, here for us to remember that. So you know that you can take a field and rephase it. And now you have to see what happens to this rephasing through all the terms in the Lagrangian. So for instance, I can take uh, uh, my electron field and rephase it as e to the minus i rho e plus psi And I can do the same for the muon, e to the minus i, rho mu plus psi mu. And the same for the tau, e to the minus i psi tau. So I have this freedom. Now what happens to the various terms in the Lagrangian? So first of all, kinetic terms are of this kind. So they contain the dagger and the field itself. So when I do a rephasing, this term will pick up plus, this term the minus, and the, the rephasing leaves uh, this term invariant. Is that clear? So these are invariant. Now, mass terms, uh, this is slightly more complicated because you have a uh, e left bar, e right. But I, can, I have the freedom to rephase the right-handed fields as well. I can simply choose to do the, exactly the same rephasing, and then this picks up the plus, this the minus, and again, the rephasing leaves overall the mass term invariant. So this is also invariant uh, with the note that you have to do the rephasing as well for E right. Now, neutral currents, they also contain terms of this kind. So they are, again, invariant. The only term where you're doing something is actually the charge current term. Because what you're doing, you are eliminating this side of the matrix. You are absorbing these phases, which disappear from your Lagrangian. So these two phases here and this are unphysical. I can rephase them away. Now, we can do the same for neutrinos. I can do the rephasing for neutrinos on this side. Remember the, the, the neutrino. <coughs> sits on this side of the uh, mixing matrix. And therefore, I can eliminate these two phases as well. This is correct if you have Dirac neutrinos. If you have Majorana neutrinos, you can surely do this rephasing. But then there is a condition, which is the Majorana condition. And in that condition, the rephasing makes the phases reappear. So you can move them, if you want, from the Lagrangian to the Majorana condition, but they remain physical. And in fact, they enter neutrino as double beta decay. So the conclusion of this, I can use this one here, is that the 3 by 3 mixing matrix 
as three angles and then one phase if neutrinos are Dirac and three phases if neutrinos are Majorana, physical phases, relevant for physical situations and for measurable, at least in principle. I can give you the full parameterization to see how um, uh, the matrix element enters. Um, it's a bit long to write. Um, so indeed what I'll do, uh, i just give you the first row because we will use that in neutrino as a bulb beta decay um, and leave the other entries mm. and you can look them up uh, in the notes. It's a formula, but it's obvious, but uh, six um, in the notes. So, and this first row contains the cosine of the angle 1, 2 and the cosine of the angle 1, 3. The second entry is the sine of the angle 1, 2 and the cosine of the angle 1, 3. And the last entry is the sine of 1, 3 and e to the minus i delta which is this phase here. And then there is a, the diagonal matrix, this piece here, which contains the two uh, Majorana phases, which will not enter neutrino oscillations, uh, however. For anti-neutrinos, you have to change U to U star. So that's where CP violation enters. It, if uh, you have these phases different from zero or pi, you will have effects which are different for neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, for instance, in neutrino oscillation experiments. Um, this is, I'll write it here. So for anti-neutrinos, U goes into U star. Okay, so now we have all the formalities which is necessary to understand neutrino oscillations. And so what I want to do is first discuss a little bit the basic picture and then go into the derivation of uh, neutrino oscillations. We need some quantum mechanics and a little bit of trigonometry. Um, we started at 30, so for, well, then we do five minutes of break. And then uh, we start with neutrino oscillations. During the break, uh, but you can do whatever you want, it's a break. Um, but I want to show you something. Um, so if any of you has a, an iPhone or an iPad, there is an app which that does any of you have? Otherwise I'll show you just on my phone. Um, so there is an app which is called uh, a neutrino scope is something that we developed for outreach um, and it's quite cute. So you can download it for free. So, um, and what you will see is um, you have various options. So for example, I want to switch on uh, power station. That's my favorite actually. So you will see, uh, well, there are no power stations in that direction. They are in this. So here, for example, you have a power station. You see the neutrinos as, uh, you would see them if you could visualize them, coming from the, rea the power station. So for example, in that direction, you have the Spanish ones. Uh, there is France. <laughs> okay, on this side, oh, this is the US. So the various US ones. Uh, you can see, you can see if there's something in that direction. No, not really. Okay, there you have Bulgaria. And down there you have India and, uh, okay, China and Japan. So it's quite cute. And um, you can look at the Earth neutrinos, which come different colors because they've oscillated. So they come, these are geoneutrinos produced um, in, um, in the case in the Earth. You have atmospheric neutrinos. And of course, the flavor component is different if they're coming from above or from below. And uh, you can see the sun. So that's actually 
quite cute. Ah, there. That's the sun. So, and of course, it's a very strong uh, source of neutrinos. Uh, so it's, it's very, very bright. So it's kind of just a cute app that you can download and uh, if you want to do, you know, kind of show your friends where neutrinos are, etc., cetera, um, you can use it. Yes, so then, okay, uh, this is all recorded, right? So I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> usual, yes. So this was something which was developed with a company, um, Cambridge Consultants, and um, they have been great because I think this app is really, really cute. Uh, but we have been able to develop only for um, iOS. So uh, it would be nice, actually, to have it for other... Uh, it's something that we are trying kind of to see if they are interested in doing. So another maybe two, three minutes and break, and then we start with neutrino oscillations. Um, sorry, it's just this matrix here. Yeah, so you should, I think you should. So, so here. Um, this is. Well, yes, sure. I mean, I defined it the other the other way around. This is my U dagger, if you want, right? Because I'm sandwiching between the le the leptons and the neutrinos. So this must be U dagger, and therefore this comes here. This P matrix should be identified. Yes, yes, because I have um, I've rephased the way the field, the, uh, the neutrino fields, yes. So, the mm -hmm. This is the observed value, and this is the prediction that you can do in your standard model, very, very precise. You know, what is the decay rate of the Z into neutrino, neutrino? So we know that very, very precisely. And then so when you do this ratio, it will tell you how many times the Z has decayed into a neutrino-neutrino pair, or invisibly, to be more precise. So, so this is the tradition from the Yes. This is the observation from yes. the The invisible decay of the Z, so you measure the Z, Yes, the z-width, and you measure all the visible channels, and then in that way you can reconstruct what is the invisible uh, z-width. Uh, uh, well, yes, it's just um, um, an example. An example. Yes, it's not a real one. <laughs> it would no, be no. nice. <laughs> it would be nice, no? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Running to write a paper right away. <laughs> okay, so let's start back.
Okay, I think we can start back. So the rest of this lecture concerns neutrino oscillations. And so let's first look at the basic picture. What a neutrino oscillation means is a phenomenon which I start with a certain flavor, nu alpha, produ produced in a certain process. Then I let the neutrinos travel, and then I detect them, and I find that there is a different flavor at detection. So it's a transition from one flavor to the other. Um, and uh, it's key in our understanding of particle <laughs> physics because having observed neutrino oscillations, implies neutrino masses and mixing and physics beyond the standard model. So for me, it's really a very, very important uh, uh, result. So how does it work? Well, in production and detection, these processes happen because of standard model interactions. In particular, we're interested in charge current interactions because that is what allows me to identify the flavor of the neutrino. As I mentioned earlier, I define the flavor of a certain neutrino by looking at the charge um, lepton which is produced or involved in the specific uh, interaction, either in production or in decay. A typical example is pion decay produces a muon neutrino because pion decay mainly into muons, so that produces a beam of muon neutrinos. Now, what matters in between instead is massive neutrinos, or more specifically, the eigenstates of uh, the Hamiltonian, which describes the propagation. Uh, for most, uh, um, in most cases, a free um, uh, Hamiltonian, so will be just the massive neutrinos. We'll look a little bit, uh, um, if we can today, um, or otherwise, uh, at the beginning of the next lecture, what happens when you are in a um, uh, dense medium, or well, not so dense, the Earth um, already. In that case, this picture changes slightly. But what matters is that production, detection, and propagation are not described by the same uh, states. And this is what leads to the oscillations. Uh, you must be aware of very similar situations in quantum mechanics. Any time in which kind of you start with a state which is not aligned to the operator which describes the evolution, you end up with oscillations, spins, precession, and many other cases um, <coughs> like that. So now let's uh, derive the oscillation probability. So we start with then the state nu alpha. So let's consider, just take a generic time, equals zero. And here we have a state produced in an interaction. So for instance, let's talk about the mu neutrino that I discussed earlier, or, or alpha, just generic alpha. This is the state at t equals zero, and uh, as we discussed earlier, this is the superposition of massive states. Uh, before I talked about uh, uh, fields, and I, I talk about fl states, and that's what brings in this uh, conjugate uh, here that we have to carry through our definitions. <laughs> So now I ask, uh, what is the probability of nu alpha going to nu beta at a certain time t? So first of all, I have to look at the evolution of this state. And uh, I just need to use uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, the evolution of my state, psi, uh, neutrino, is going to be the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So it's very simply, nu at time t is e to the minus i h t applied to the initial state. I use natural units, so h bar is 1, c is 1, etc. cetera. 
And then, if I want to compute this oscillation probability, what I need to do is project the state at time t over the new beta direction and square that. So what I do is take this projection and uh, square it. Now, this operator here, the Hamiltonian, its eigenstates are the massive states. So what I need to do to understand the evolution is express uh, this new alpha in terms of the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, yeah, like you did in quantum mechanics many other times. So what you will get is uh, new beta e to the minus i ht applied to the sum over i of u alpha i star new i. Now, I know what the Hamiltonian does on its own eigenstate. This will bring in here the eigenvalue of this eigenstate. So what I get is new beta e to the minus i e i t sum over i u alpha i star new i. I mean, it's obvious that this i is an index and uh, this is i, right? So um, now I'm dealing with orthonormal states. So now this, if I express this in terms of massive states, now new j, when I encounter a new j, new i, this will give me a delta ij. Is that clear or do I need to do the step? No. And so at the end, I will end up with the modulus square of sum over i of u alpha i star u beta i e to the minus i e i t modulus squared. There's one additional step. I deal with highly relativistic neutrinos in 99% of the situations which are interesting experimentally or even theoretically. And this means that now I need to, I can expand this EI so for relativistic neutrinos I can expand EI in terms of the momentum plus MI squared divided by 2E. And if I do that, when I take the modulus square, I can uh, um, kind of collect and cancel out the term e to the minus i pt, which is common uh, in that sum. And therefore, I'm left with the modulus square of sum over i of u alpha i star u beta i e to the minus i delta m squared i minus 1, oh, let, let's call it like this, i 1 t divided by 2 e modulus squared with the following definition, delta m squared i 1 is m i squared minus m 1 squared because I've done the same, I've collected in front the e to the minus i m1 squared t divided by 2e. I collected in front of the sum and I took the modulus square of that. And if you want, this is the master formula of neutrino oscillations in vacuum. and then we can look at it in various uh, 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 situations. But before doing that, I want to discuss a few key uh, theoretical issues associated to this derivation. So the first point comes here, and I've assumed that in a new alpha, I produce the three states coherently, the three massive states. 
Now, this is a, a basic of neutrino oscillations. You need the coherence of the initial state. But I want to ask you how it is possible to do that and uh, satisfy energy momentum conservation. So, let's think of a pi on decay. So, let's say that my new alpha at t equals zero is a new mu coming from a pi on decay. So this, if you want, is a note. So in my uh, pion decay, I have the energy of the muon. Let's take it, uh, uh, sorry, the energy of the pion. Let's take that at rest. Uh, and so I will produce that E pion is equal to E of the muon plus the energy of neutrino one. I've also produced uh, neutrino two. So I have that the energy of the pion is also E mu plus E2. And I need also to satisfy momentum conservation. So now if I take that approximation in which I've taken the same momentum for all the three neutrinos, then I will have that E1 is the square root of P squared plus M1 squared and E2 is equal to the square root of p squared plus m2 squared. But I cannot satisfy, obviously, these relations and uh, momentum conservation as well, which is what I assumed here by taking the same momentum. So what's wrong? I mean, the picture is correct. Coherence is satisfying. But what have I kind of, what approximation have I made here? What does it mean that I've taken a definite momentum? What does it tell you in terms of the size of my wave function? Yes, it's a plane wave, essentially. Now, this is not true in normal experimental configurations. Production happens in a certain space and time, detection similarly, and then you have the propagation in between. Which means that just by the nature of the production, for instance, in a pion decay, there is a typical scale, which is the decay time of the pion. This defines a delta T, and therefore defines a delta E, which gives me a delta P and a delta X. So I've made this approximation of taking the, the same momentum uh, because it's useful for me to carry through the computation. But in reality, what I should be doing is use a wave packet formalism in which I have a wave function <coughs> with a certain size and a certain momentum spread. And if the momentum spread, which is defined in this way, is bigger than the differences induced by the neutrino masses, then I produce the state coherently the three massive state coherently uh, in new alpha. If the spread is too small compared to the difference in masses, then you don't, you don't produce them coherently. You either produce some massive states or the others. This is not an experiment. Experimentally, for the neutrinos that we know of, this does not happen. But if you had sterile neutrinos which were sufficiently heavy, then this could be the case. So. We have to take into account the um, uncertainty principle to guarantee that we have coherence of uh, our state. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting, for instance, uh, if you think of uh, neutrinos coming from very distant sources, for example, supernovas. There you have the three components in your wave packet, which has a certain size. And they will travel with slightly different velocities because they have slightly different masses. And so if they travel sufficiently long distances, not Earth or solar type of distances, but really a kind of supernova type uh, distances, it's possible that the three components separate. And so you will not observe a neutrino of a certain flavor, but you will observe neutrinos of a certain mass of which you see a certain flavor component when you detect them. 
So, as I said, this is more of a note. The formalism is uh, consistent and uh, leads you to the correct result, but you have this underlying uh, kind of assumption that you need to make to impose coherence as an additional ingredient uh, to the picture. Okay, so um, what are the properties um, of these oscillations. Now, we can look at the, um, specific uh, cases. The simplest one is the two neutrino oscillation case. And this is relevant in many different experimental configurations. So why don't we um, look at this probability, but in the case in which I have just two neutrino mixing, which is the simplest one I can possibly consider. So in the case of two neutrino oscillation, the mixing matrix, as I discussed earlier, can be parameterized just by one mixing angle and one phase which does not enter neutrino oscillations. And so if I take that master formula, which is there, and now I write down the components of the mixing uh, matrix, what I will get is simply, why don't I do it, U alpha 1 star U beta 1 plus U alpha 2 star U beta 2 e to the minus i delta m square 2 1 L divided by 2 e modulus squared. C is equal to 1 for me, so T and L uh, uh, are equal, yes. Uh, e is the energy of the neutrino. In fact, there, if you want, I made, a, uh, again, an approximation. Well, I've taken E to be equal to P, common for all the three neutrinos, because additional corrections will be higher order in the mass squared. So thanks for, thanks for the question. So this is the common neutrino energy, uh, neglecting uh, small mass square differences. OK, so now u alpha 1, so cos theta, u beta 1, sine theta. So this will lead me to cos theta or minus cos theta sine theta plus cos theta sine theta e to the minus i delta m squared to 1 L divided by 2 e. And with a little bit of trigonometry, you can now express that probability equal to sine square 2 theta, which comes from squaring cos square and sine square uh, there. And then I have a sine square delta m square to 1 L divided by 4e. I leave this to you as an exercise to derive. It's very simple. But this formula is very useful to understand how I determine the parameters from the experimental observations. So first of all, if I want to observe neutrino oscillations, I need to have sufficiently long distances so that this term develops. Because at very small L over E, this term is uh, negligible. And then there will be a, a distance, or an, an, for a fixed distance, an energy for which this term becomes pi over 2, and that is the first oscillation maximum. 
And then when L over E, either E becomes very, very small or L becomes very large, now I can see the other oscillation maximum, but um, keep in mind that um, typically I will end up um, integrating over a certain delta E because I, as delta E becomes very, very small, it becomes more difficult to, to measure the energy precisely, and so I have just to average over many different oscillations. So if you want, if you look at the oscillation probability as a function of L over E, you will have that the first they develop, they will reach a first oscillation maximum, and then you have all the other oscillations that you need to average out, and the average of the sine square is a one-half. Multiply by your sine square, two theta. So this is the uh, appearance probability, which means the probability of a flavor to change. As overall, the probability needs to, remain, to be equal to one, because you don't lose neutrinos. They can just change from one flavor to the other. So the probability of disappearance, which is the probability of new alpha remaining the same, is one minus that term there, the probability of new alpha going to new beta. Indeed, experimentally, in many cases, it's easier to measure this probability rather than uh, this one. For instance, atmospheric neutrinos, you measure the disappearance probability of new neutrinos, not the appearance probability new mu into new tau. And, that, and from there, you can still deduce the value of the mixing angle and uh, the delta m square. Now, notice that uh, uh, there are a couple of properties which I find um, particularly interesting. Now, if I look at the CP term, so if I look at the probability of new bar alpha going into new bar beta for the antineutrinos, this is equal to new alpha new beta because there's no CP violation, there's no phases in the mixing matrix. Which also means that if you want to look for neutrino, uh, for CP violation in the lepton sector via neutrino oscillations, you cannot use situations in which a two neutrino approximation is a good one because it, it has no sensitivity to those parameters. Uh, leptonic CP violation is one of the main goals of the current and future experimental neutrino program. So this consideration is actually uh, very important. And in this fact, it is just with the current generation of neutrino uh, oscillation experiments that we have some sensitivity to leptonic CP violation because we have got, been able to go beyond the two neutrino um, uh, mixing approximations and can start seeing the effects of the full three neutrino mixing. And the next generation, which is Dune and T2 hyper K, are the experiments which are devoted actually to study this in full and they are supposed to start in 2025-26. Now, if I use CPT, this gives me also the uh, probability, the T-conjugated channel, new beta into new alpha. And again, we know that this needs, is equal to new alpha, new beta. Again, because there's no uh, CP value phase um, into this. Now, this is not just a pure academic uh, exercise to compute the two-neutrino oscillation probability, but indeed, in three-neutrino oscillation, uh, in the full three-neutrino mixing, in many experimental situations, we can rec uh, reduce the probability to something similar uh, to that one above. Um, and this is what uh, we are going to do now. Um, as, and this will allow us to interpret the experimental results which have been found, which we are going to do at the beginning of the next lecture. Okay, so now let's look at three neutrino oscillations, which is the real experimental situation. As we will see again in the next lecture, we have measured precisely two delta m squares. Delta m square 3, 1, which is measured to be around 2.5 
10 to the minus 3 EV squared, and delta M squared to 1, which is around 7.9, 10 to the minus 5 EV squared. So the values are extremely tiny if you compare that to any other uh, fermion mass, but we'll come to that when we discuss uh, um, neutrino masses in the context of beyond the standard model physics. For the purposes of, cosmo of um, phenomenology, well, what we want to understand now is compute the delta m square to 1 L divided by uh, 4e or 2e, and the delta m square 3 1 L divided by 4e in experimentally relevant uh, situations, so with given L's and given E's, and that will tell me if these terms are small or big, uh, so what kind of approximations I can make. So I have a table, maybe instead of, um, can I just show one slide? This will work with the recording. Okay, instead of writing it down, you have it here. So these are the typical average energies and typical lengths. So in atmospheric neutrinos, um, atmospheric neutrinos, as I discussed earlier, come from decays of pions and kaons in the atmosphere. So they have a very, very broad range of energies. At a typical energy, we can take 10 GeV. And as a typical distance, well, they go from 10 kilometers, kind of the ones we produce just above us in the atmosphere, and the ones which come from the other side of the Earth, those will travel 12,000 kilometers. But if I plug in as a typical distance, uh, 6,000 kilometers, this is what I get. You see, this is the right values to see oscillations due to delta m squared 3, 1, while the effects due to 2, 1 are too small to be observed. Now, reactor neutrinos is a completely different ballpark. These are um, electron antineutrinos with a typical energy around 3 MeV. And there has been experiments which have had the detector of one kilometer from the source or an average of 100 kilometers from the source. And again, you see here the values. <laughs> Therefore, the kind of short baseline reactor neutrino experiments are sensitive to delta m square 3, 1, while the long baseline ones, in particular this Kamland, um, are sensitive to delta m square 2, 1. And indeed, Kamland has provided the most uh, precise measurement of delta m square 2, 1. Um, then we have lots of accelerator experiments, well, lots, some. Uh, which have a typical energy is between 1 GV and few GV, with a distance which is matched to give you the first oscillation maximum there. So it's no surprise that these uh, give you the right, uh, the exactly right values that you want. <laughs> the effects uh, due to delta m squared to, um, to 1 are at a few percent level. These are the effects you want uh, if you have to look for um, CP violation in the lepton sector. And then there are experiments, short baseline experiments, in which you have similar energies but very, very short distances. And you see, you should not see any oscillation oscillations because these values are too small. And now there has been some hints in favor of oscillations, and therefore this points to a different delta m square, and this is, brings in the issue of sterile neutrinos that we will discuss at some point, um, uh, probably around lecture four. So now what I would like you to do is actually to compute these uh, values, um, uh, which are um, by expressing your term here in terms of kilometers and GVs or MEVs, uh, use the fact that we are dealing with natural units, so C equal to 1, H bar equal to 1, and so it will be kind of easy for you to derive. So I leave this to you as an exercise. So let's look at the first uh, case, the, the, these uh, cases here, in which I can neglect uh, the uh, oscillations due to delta m squared to 1. So in that case, we can take our master formula. So let's take the master formula that I've erased, obviously. So uh, so the first case, case A, in which delta m square to 1 L divided by 4E is negligible. So 
And let's look at the appearance probability. So new alpha going to new beta. Now in that master formula, I have the sum over three terms. The first term is u alpha one star u beta one. The second term is u alpha two star u beta two e to the minus i del times square two one l divided by two e. But we said that this is much smaller than one. And therefore, I can approximate this with a zero and this with a one. So I'll cancel it. And then we have the last term, which is the relevant one, u alpha three, u beta three, e to the minus i delta m squared, three, one, l divided by two e modulo squared. And now what I need to notice that this can be re-expressed in terms of u alpha three star u beta three by using unitarity. So this is equal to minus u alpha three star u beta three. Because u alpha one star u beta one, u alpha two star beta two, u alpha three star beta three is equal to delta alpha beta, right? is a u dagger u alpha beta component, which is the identity, alpha beta, so delta alpha beta. And therefore, now, I can rewrite this as a simply u alpha three star u beta three modulus squared, and then the term minus one plus e to the minus i delta m squared three one l divided by two e modulus squared, but, and this is completely analog, um, analogous to what we have done in the two neutrino case, the exercise that I asked you to do in the two neutrino oscillation case. And in fact, I can use trigonometry there, and I can find that nu alpha into nu beta is equal to two u alpha three star u beta three modulus squared sine square delta m square three one l divided by four e. So it's very similar to the neutrino oscillation uh, case with two neutrino mixing, but I have to plug in the values of u alpha three and u beta three depending on what is alpha and beta. And so you take that formula uh, six in, uh, in the notes, you plug in the values, and this will tell you, depending on what is the experimental situation you, um, you look at, what is your sensitivity. So for example, new tau is sensitive to uh, theta two three. We will use this, so remember this formula. We will use that tomorrow when we look at special experimental situations, and this will tell them what mixing angles, etc., um, uh, the experiment is actually measuring. Uh, well, in fact, it's a theta 2 3 for atmospheric neutrinos and accelerator neutrinos, and it is theta 1 3 for reactor neutrinos at short baseline, the one kilometer case. The other case, the case B, is the opposite limit. The case in which uh, instead delta m squared 3, 1 L divided by 4 E is very big. And as I mentioned earlier, in that case you have to average out uh, the probability. So sine squared theta and cos squared theta terms will become one half. Sine um, it's not theta, delta m squared, I'll divide it by three. And in terms of the linear in the sine and cosine will get averaged to zero. The only probability which is relevant to consider in these cases is the anti nu e into anti nu e one, which is the one relevant for the reactor neutrinos with 100 kilometers. So again, I leave to you as an exercise doing this averaging of the sine square, cosine square, and um, sines and cosines, and what you will find is this oscillation probability, um, which is here. So it's the cosine of 1, 3 to the fourth, 
and then so for cosine to the fourth, and then one minus sine square two theta one two sine square delta m square two one l divided by four e plus a term which depends on sine square uh, sine to the fourth of theta one three. As I said, I leave that to you as an exercise. But this tells you that if I look at uh, Camland, so reactor neutrinos 2, this will measure very well this delta m squared to 1 parameter, which is indeed what has happened experimentally. The last thing I want to do in the remaining two minutes is to discuss CP violation. So CP violating effects. As we discussed already, the two neutrino approximation tells you that you need, um, does not, is not sensitive to CP violations. So you need to go through three neutrino oscillation cases to be any sensitivity to the delta phase. <laughs> and what you can look is at the CP asymmetry. So you can look at the difference of the probability of new alpha going to new beta minus the probability of the conjugated channel anti new alpha going into anti new beta. Um, it takes a bit of time to do this computation, so I leave it to you as an exercise for those who are particularly enthusiastic. But what you will find that this depends on all the mixing angles, so is uh, 4, and let me use this shortcut. So when I write S12, I mean the sine of theta12, and C12 is the cosine of theta12. So 4 times <coughs> sine of theta12, cosine of theta12, sine of theta13, cosine of theta13 squared, sine of theta to 3, cosine of theta to 3, sine of delta, this is the CP violating part, and then I have the dependence on the mass square differences. So I have a sine of delta m square to 1 L divided by 2E plus the sine square of delta m square 1, 3. L divided by 2e plus the sine, the sine of delta m square 3, 2 divided, L divided by 2e. Sorry. This is um, the CP asymmetry in vacuum, and it tells you something very interesting. First of all, it is a, a genuinely three neutrino mixing effect. If I reduce down to to neutrino mixing, some of these angles become zero and the effect goes away. It depends on the delta phase. So, and we did expect that because we said for neutrino, when I go from neutrinos to antineutrinos, I change the product, U to U star. So I ne it needs to depend on uh, the complex part of this matrix, which is controlled by delta. If delta is zero or pi, again, this asymmetry goes to zero. And conversely, if I measure an asymmetry which is different from zero, this tells me the delta is different from zero or pi, and I have CP violation. And the other interesting thing is that if I set delta to 1 to 0, then, so this term disappears, and then 1, 3, which is m1 squared minus m3 squared, is equal to minus m3 squared minus m2, which in case is also equal to m1 squared. So these terms cancel out. 
which also tells you that if you want to look for CP violation in long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments, you need to be sensitive to other effects due to 2 1. And we have seen that typically those effects are at the order of a few percent, roughly 4%. Um, and this tells you, therefore, that this is a particularly difficult and challenging issue. We'll come, I will discuss that a little bit more in detail as it is clearly a, a big uh, goal of the next generation of experiments. So I want to stop here, maybe just recap what we have done today. So we looked at the basics of neutrinos, how they fit in the standard model in terms of SU2 doublets, etc., and look at the three generations. And then we looked at neutrino oscillations in vacuum, the uh, kind of the master formula, which uh, uh, was somewhere at the Dyke Council, and then the, CP, uh, the cases which are relevant from an experimental point of view. Now, we can use then these formulas to understand the experiments, and we will do that uh, um, the next uh, lecture. What we are doing next is this phenomenology aspect, and before that, we will look at uh, neutrino oscillations in uh, MET, because the eigenstates change, and therefore the oscillations uh, change and you can have enhancements, resonances, etc. and we will look at that uh, next time. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm in the office and you are, feel free to come and discuss things. Thank you.